so um, why a lecture on the Yoga Sutras then? If one's going to give a talk on Indian philosophy, the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads are much more, much more poetic, um, they're much more inspiring as language. In comparison, the Yoga Sutras is a rather technical text, although very profound. So why choose this? Well, in my lifetime, I have witnessed the most extraordinary blossoming of yoga in the West, whereby there are classes, yoga classes, probably in your town, probably in your village hall, you know, throughout the land, throughout the West. And following in on the coattails of yoga have come other aspects of Indian thought, such as Ayurveda, which is the, the yogic science of medicine, and also Indian philosophy. So nowadays, texts, well, particularly the Yoga Sutras, is taught on every teacher training course, and it's really becoming part of our culture. So ideas and practices that 70 years ago would have been unfamiliar or seem foreign, like the idea of, say, the law of karma, or even the practice of meditation 70 years ago, it was not so common. Um, that these things are just completely part of, of, of our landscape, our cultural landscape. So it seems a good idea, especially if we do go to yoga classes, that um, we should have a little more of an idea about it. So I'd like to start by um, briefly setting the recent historical context um, by mentioning two figures who have been very influential in the coming of Indian philosophy and yoga to the West. So these are Swami Vivekananda and Krishnamacharya. Swami Vivekananda was a monk from Bengal and he was the most famous disciple of Ramakrishna. And if you know anything about Indian um, spirituality, you will have heard the name Ramakrishna. He was one of the very greatest saints of the 19th century. So Vivekananda um, came over to the West and at the end of the 19th century, and he attended, he was the first Hindu, I think, to attend um, the Parliament of World Religions in Chicago in 1893 where he was an absolute wow. Everybody was totally impressed and struck by the clarity of his presentation and the authority with which he spoke. And he then went on to write books and to teach Indian philosophies of yoga and Vedanta. And when I say Vedanta, I mean the philosophy of the Upanishads. And in particular, he was a he was associated with Advaita Vedanta, which is non-dual Vedanta. So if you look at the picture, you can see that there is a quote along the side, um, and I'll just read it to you. It says, one infinite, pure and holy, beyond thought, beyond qualities, I bow down to thee. So that's Vivekananda. The other one on the right um, is Krishnamacharya. I don't think he came to the West um, and he wasn't a monk. He was a polymath. He had degrees in all six of the classical schools of Indian thought. Um, he was also an Ayurvedic doctor and he was a yogi. And he spent, I think, about seven years in the Himalayas with his teacher and at the end of that time, his teacher told him to go back to become a householder and to teach yoga. And that maybe was a bit surprising because um, being a yoga teacher um, in India at that time was by no means considered a very prestigious thing to do. But he did as he was told and he, be he came under the patronage of the Maharaja of Mysore um, but he also had 
some very famous students. And you may have heard, if you, if you do yoga, you may have heard of Mr. Iyengar. Iyengar was his student, um, as also was his son, Desika Char. And Krishnamacharya is often thought of as the, as the father of modern yoga. So if you were to picture an image in your mind of yoga, I wonder what it would look like. Well, I imagine that the image will be something like this, um, maybe downward dog or something like that. Actually, interestingly enough, although asana is part of the Yoga Sutras, it's by no means the focus. Only 2% of the entire text, three sutras, are concerned with asana. They don't actually describe any asanas, they describe the qualities of stability and comfort or ease, which we were practicing at the beginning in our little meditation at the beginning. But if, if Patanjali did have an image in mind, it would be more like the one on the right rather than the ones on the left, because asana's purpose is preparation of the body to sit in meditation. So the postural yoga practiced so enthusiastically today is not the only type of yoga. In fact, it is actually a much later development. So yoga, the word yoga, it has a variety. It's used in a variety of different ways um, in the different ancient texts. And also there are different paths of yoga. Postural yoga um, evolved as Hatha yoga, but there are other much older paths as well. These are Jnana Yoga, which is the yoga of knowledge, Karma Yoga of action in the sense of selfless action, selfless service, Bhakti Yoga, which is devotion to God, and Raja Yoga. Raja means royal, but Raja Yoga mainly focuses on meditation. And each one of these paths um, is a complete path in itself, but they can also be practiced together. And in the Bhagavad Gita, it's very interesting because Krishna gives various pen portraits of these different yogis, the Jnana yogi or the Bhakti yogi or the Karma yogi, and they all sound very similar. And for any of you who have um, attended one of the residential courses at Bashara, these four aspects of yoga might ring a bell because actually they correspond with the four aspects of the courses, which are um, study, yoga of knowledge, work, doing what's necessary, yoga of action, devotion, devotional practices, and daily meditation three times a day. So it's maybe not so surprising that there is this coincidence. Okay, so who was Patanjali and what are the Yoga Sutras? Well, we actually know very little about the man. We don't really know a great deal about when he lived, but it was probably sometime between 200 BC and maybe 200 AD. Um, but what we do know is that he gathered together from the ancient scriptures the teachings on the mind and the practices on meditation, and he systematized them. So he didn't originate the practices, the teachings, but he did condense and refine them, so giving permanent form and definition to yoga. And here you see in this statue, he's represented as sort of half man, half snake. And the snake is a reference to the cosmic snake Adi Shesha, on whom Vishnu, named for God, reclines in the moments between the creation of the, of the worlds. So his coils, the snake's coils, are soft and comfortable enough to act as a couch for God, and yet his many heads are strong enough to hold up on, on his heads all the universes. So that's, that's some of the symbolism there. 
So the fact that he's associated with Vishnu is an indication of the original divine origin of the teachings. And you'll find that um, all the classical in Hindu teachings, they all are traced in a line, ultimately back to the divine, indicating that they are revealed. They're not just um, man-made. So what is a sutra then? A sutra is a combination of words threaded together. It, it aims to pack the maximum meaning into the fewest number of words. It's what we might call an aphorism. And in a sutra, every single syllable is important. In fact, there's a, there's a, a, a saying that a sutra writer takes more pleasure in saving a single syllable than he does in the birth of a child. So I imagine they, they don't have much of a family life. Um, this text, the Yoga Sutras, is absolutely tiny. It has 196 sutras. None of them are any longer than six words. So the whole thing would fit on two sides of A4. And within that is, is given the whole science of yoga, the aim, the practices, the obstacles, how to overcome them, and detailed descriptions of the results. But because they're so minimal and because they're not written in normal sentence form, they're actually incomprehensible. <laughs> On their own, they're incomprehensible. So they have to be read with a commentary. And there have been many commentators um, through the centuries but the first is probably the most famous, and that is Vyasa. And we will be referring to him in a moment. So the Yoga Sutras are divided into four pada. A pada means foot. Um, so four parts, four feet, four chapters. And the first chapter, which is a chapter on Samadhi, defines yoga and its aim. And it describes the enlightened mind that has achieved samadhi. And it also distinguishes various levels and degrees within samadhi. And it's aimed at an advanced practitioner. It's aimed at the highest level yogi who already has a calm and settled mind. The second chapter, the sadhana pada, is on practice. Sadhana is your spiritual practice. And this is for the student who has more difficulty in achieving the meditative state, and it describes a more active approach. It also includes the path of yoga as the eightfold path, which you may be familiar with. The third chapter um, describes certain powers um, that you may encounter on the way. So these are sort of supernatural powers. One reads stories of yogis who can be in two places at the same time or can make themselves invisible or all these extraordinary things, communicators at a distance like we are. Um, but basically what uh, Patanjali has to say about this is that don't be distracted by them, they're not the point. And then finally, the last chapter, Kaivalyapada, which is on liberation, which is the final goal of yoga, is more philosophical and it includes a rather gentlemanly response to Buddhism. In my talk, when I first um, wrote this talk, I included three topics. One is the first four sutras of the first chapter, which give the definition and goal of yoga. And then moving on to chapter two, Patanjali talks about the things that get in the way and how they cause us to suffer. And as I mentioned, the second chapter also includes the eight limbs of yoga. But I realized that I'd actually prepared two talks. So in fact, this talk is only going to focus on the first topic, which is really just the first four verses, the first four sutras. And I make no apology for this because it really gives us the essence of yoga. 
Um, if later on you want to ask about any of these other things, you're, you're welcome to. But I'm going to focus on this very first part. That's just, a dis that's just an image of the, um, the eight limbs of yoga. So yoga begins, Atta Yoga Nushasanam. Now, Atta is set forth the authoritative teaching, Anushasanam, on yoga. I mentioned that every syllable is important in these sutras, and there are many, many paragraphs being written on the first word now, which is also used as at the beginning of some other sutra texts. But just for now, let's it suffice to say that this word atta it conveys a blessing and an auspicious beginning of a project about to begin. And the project that's beginning, this authoritative teaching, is instruction on how to practice. It's not mere philosophy. It actually supposes, presupposes that we've already we're already familiar with the teachings of the Upanishads. We already accept their truth. We know that we're an Atman, the eternal self, an eternal self, but maybe it isn't yet a living reality for us. We haven't yet realized it. And so what we need is practice. Without practice, nothing can be achieved. And I'm going to just on this point, give a quote, actually it's not from um, the Yoga Sutras, although I think Patanjali would thoroughly have approved it. Um, it's from a later text which says, the practitioner will succeed, the non-practitioner will not. Success in yoga is not achieved by merely reading books. So as I say, I think Patanjali would have thoroughly agreed with that. So moving on to the second sutra, um, okay, if you wanted to learn just one sutra from the Yoga Sutras, this is the one that it would be, Yoga Chittavriti Nirodaha which means yoga is the restraint, the nirodaha of the modifications, the vritti of the mind, chitta. So yoga is all about the mind, chitta. And it's about a state of the mind, which is called vritti nirodaha. So what are these vrittis then? What are these modifications or movements of the mind? What do they refer to? Well, they refer to really all mental processes which are in constant movement, constant flux. So they refer to anything at all that appears in our psychological or emotional arena. And that could be thoughts, it could be feelings, it could be desires, it could be memories. And these things could be both conscious and unconscious. So if we were to picture the mind as an ocean, the movements of the mind might be the ripples and the waves on the surface that we may be conscious of, but the movement of water is also affected by currents deep down within that we are not aware of. And both of these can, can, can cause movement. So they're both included. But in the state of Nirodaha, all of these vrittis, all of them are stopped. And the mind is totally clear and still, right down to its depths. Okay, I'm now going to give you another definition. Uh, sorry, another translation of this sutra. And this is from Desika Cha, who is the, or who was the son of Krishnamacharya. And his rendering of this sutra is, yoga is to direct the mind exclusively towards an object and to sustain that direction without any distractions. Now, how on earth 
does he get that from those words, yoga, chitta, vritti, nirodaha? Um, I, I think I said at the beginning that actually any translation is already an interpretation because you know you have to know how the words fit together. But this seems really rather a loose interpretation. So where does it come from? Well, I mentioned that um, the Yoga Sutras are normally read with a commentary <clears throat> and the most important commentary is that of Vyasa, which is almost considered you know, as important as the sutras themselves. And Vyasa describes five levels of mind, two of which are associated with this state of samadhi. And they are, first of all, the mind that is obsessively active, overstimulated, you might say stressed. It's like a drunk monkey sort of lurching around all over the place. The second one is the exact opposite. It's a mind that is really dull and stuck. And the image here is of a, a big heavy water buffalo standing for hours in water, unmoving. The third level of mind um, is sometimes clear and purposeful and confident, but sometimes it's not. In other words, it's variable. And this is the most common state of mind that we find ourselves in. But then we come to the mind that is one pointed. So here there is no distraction. All of the, the, the whole of the intent of our attention is focused exclusively and smoothly and constantly on one point. It could be all sorts of things. And then finally, we've already encountered this word, nirodaha. Um, this is where the vrittis, the movements, have stopped. They are absent. The mind is totally clear and still right down to its depths. So why then does um, Desika Char give this definition? Well, I think it's probably um, so that we understand that the stopping of the riches of the mind is not by trying to stop them. It's not by suppressing thought, thinking that we can suppress thought. But the way to Nirodaha is actually this focusing, this concentration, and that we can practice. In fact, most meditation is actually practiced towards that. Whereas the state of Nirodaha is not something we can practice. It may happen by grace or it may not happen. So why is Chitta Vritti Narodaha considered so important? Why is it so important to still the mind in this way? What happens then? Then it says, Tada, then, Drashtu, the Sia, Svarupe, in its own nature, Avastanam is established or abides. So then the seer abides in its own nature. So what do we mean by the seer? Well, it's not seer in the eyeball sense of the word, but the power behind seeing, but the power behind thinking, the power behind the mind. In other words, consciousness itself. It's also referred to in this and other texts as Atman and as Purusha and as the truth, the self with a capital S, the true self. So at its highest level of Nirodaha, what is the state of the seer? Well, here we're told that it abides in its own nature or its own form. And the point here is that it is totally distinct from the mind whose activities have temporarily ceased. The seer abides in its own nature. So what happens the rest of the time? Well, the rest of the time, at other times, vritti sarupyam itaratra. At other times, there is identification, sarupyam, meaning identification of the seer, with the vrittis, with the modifications of the mind. So 
what happens here is that um, we seem to have lost our original identity and we now start to identify with our thoughts, our feelings, our memories, our experiences, in other words, our bodies and our minds. So, I mean, this is how we normally think. You know, if you were to describe me or anyone else on this, on this webinar, you might talk about them in terms of their gender or maybe their race or maybe, you know, what they do, their job, or, you know, if they're an athlete or if they're disabled or, you know, all of these, all of these things you identify with. I'm a victim, that's a strong identity. They can be very strong identifications of who we are and difficult to let go of. And that is something that people often encounter when they come to retire from their work. They're no longer the person they were in their work. Maybe the family's responsibilities have been fulfilled, no children to mother or father. Well, who are we then? Who are we without these? identities. Well, yoga would say that all of these are not who we are. They are more like coverings of who we are. They're like garments that clothe the true self within. And so, um, quoting again from the Bhagavad Gita, um, Krishna starts off by explaining to Arjuna that he says, you were never born, you will never die. You have never changed, you can never change. As one abandons worn out clothes and acquires new ones, so when the body is worn out, a new one is acquired by the self who lives within. And it's certainly true that we've had many bodies in the course of however many years we've had. We started off as babies and then became children and then teenagers and adults and, and eventually we grow old. And yet it's always us in these bodies. I remember my mother always used to say she felt no different than the day she was 17. And it's probably the, the same for all of us. So in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that he is going to tell Arjuna about the philosophy of Samkhya and the practice of yoga. And these two, Samkhya and yoga, are really part of the same science. So I'm just going to say a little bit about Samkhya because this is the philosophy that underlies um, the Yoga Sutras. And the first thing to notice is that it is a dualist philosophy. There are two fundamental eternal principles, both of which are necessary for manifestation. And these are Purusha and Prakriti. And Purusha is another name for the seer that we encountered um, just previously. So Purusha, um, I mean, Everything I say about this is not it because it's beyond words, but you know, we have to, we still use words. So if we were to use words, Purusha is con consciousness, but it's not consciousness of something, which is how we normally think consciousness of something. It's actually pure sheer consciousness, which we don't have a word for in English. It has no limit, it has no boundary, so it's not a thing. Pr Prakriti, on the other hand, is described as the world in potential or the world in late latency, and sometimes mother nature, because it's the source from which everything comes. And each of these two principles contributes something to the other in order for manifestation to happen. So what Prakriti contributes is name and form, Nama Rupa. So that without Prakriti, Purusha can never appear because a pure sheer cannot appear. It has no boundaries, it has no form. And then on the other side, without Purusha, 
nature is entirely insentient and inanim inanimate. It's like an empty shell, although there wouldn't even be a shell because there wouldn't even be that. So Purusha is the animating principle that supplies consciousness and life. Sometimes the, the way these two are distinguished is that Purusha is the subject, it's the seer, it's the I, the self, whereas Prakriti is the object, it's what's seen, it's it and them and me and us, it's the, it's the object. And Purusha can never be the object, it is only ever the subject. And then finally, I, I put here uh, another pair by which they're referred to, and that is Purusha is called the real and Prakriti is called the apparent. Now, what this really refers to, the real is defined in terms of that which never changes um, and that which is eternal. And because Prakriti, um, you know, the universe uh, of name and form, is constantly changing and is transient. Therefore, it's opposed to what's called the real. But it doesn't mean it has no reality at all, because as we've seen in this philosophy, Prakriti is itself an eternal principle. So there is some eternal latent reality to, um, to the universe. So this is all a bit abstract. And how does it you know, how does it relate to us and, and the way we think about ourselves? Um, it reminds me of um, a wonderful anecdote, which some of you may know because it's recounted in one of Belen's addresses, um, about a meeting between Rumi, the great Persian mystic, poet, and Yunus Emre, who is described in this anecdote as a folk poet. And Rumi read out some of his wonderful verse to both of their delights. And at the end, Yunus Emery, in great appreciation, he says, how wonderful, how fantastic what you're able to do, but what a lot of words you've used to say such a simple thing. And then Rumi says, well, how would you have said it then? And Yunus is purported to have said, I wrapped myself in flesh and bones and appeared as Eunice. So maybe just for a moment, if you just take a moment to close your eyes and for the word Eunice, substitute, substitute your own name and just say to yourself, I wrapped myself in flesh and bones and appeared as Elizabeth, Michael, whoever you are. So this sort of changes things a bit, doesn't it? Um, we're not used to seeing ourselves as the object. We're used to seeing Elizabeth as the subject. And if Elizabeth isn't the subject, well then who is this I? Who is it? So Krishna, I suppose, would say that identifying, thinking the I is Elizabeth or Michael or Jackie or Jane, is rather like identifying ourselves with our clothes. Okay, just a couple more slides. So we've just talked, we've just said that there are two fundamental aspects to reality. There are only two fundamental principles, um, one of which is the seer. But if we think about cognition, if we think about seeing or knowing, there's always three aspects to it, isn't there? There's the knower, there's the known, and there's the process of knowing. There's the seer and the seen, and there's the, the instrument of seeing, which is the mind. So if we know the seer is Purusha, we know the seen must be Prakriti, but then which one is the mind? Which side do we put the mind on? Just have a little think. Well, according to um, this philosophy, the mind is prakriti. The mind is actually matter, but it's subtle matter. It's very subtle matter. 
and it's identified with Prakriti because it can be an object. We can perceive our minds. We can know when we wake up in the morning if our minds feel sharp and bright or whether they feel a bit foggy and clouded over. Um, we can know whether, whether the mind feels agitated or if the mind feels relaxed. So the mind can be an object and it does change. So that definitely puts it on the side of Prakriti. Um, because Prakriti can never be an object of perception. It can never be known by the mind or the senses or the imagination or any faculty whatsoever that we have. It can never be an object of perception. Okay, I'm going to ask you two questions. The first question is, if the mind is clear, if it's like a, you know, a still lake that beautifully reflects the, the mountains, if it's totally clear and still, who sees through the mind? And the second question is, if the mind is confused and cloudy and foggy and getting it all wrong, who sees through the mind? So just have a moment to think about that. Well, I think the answer to the first question is pretty easy. When the mind is clear, who sees through the mind? Well, it's obviously the seer. What about the second one though? When the mind is cloudy, who sees through the mind then? And the answer is, it's a sort of trick question, but the answer is the seer. It is only ever the seer who sees through the mind. It's only ever the seer that sees through the eyes. The eyes don't see, the mind doesn't think, it looks as though it does, but it doesn't, it, it's, the, it's always, always the purusha, the seer, the knower, the pure eye, which is the subject. So it's that close, it's that close to us. At the moment, the purusha is seeing through my eyes, talking through my mouth, it is hearing through your ears. We can't escape from it. It's so close. We don't have to go anywhere to find it. We don't have to become anything. We're not already. We're already evidence of the Purusha, but we don't realize it. And um, another um, image from the Upanishads on this, it says that we're like strangers in an unfamiliar country, walking every day over buried treasure, but we don't realize it. We don't know what's under our feet. Day by day, we enter the self while in deep sleep, but we never know it, carried away by what is false. So I've just got one, I've got one image to maybe illustrate this confusion. So here we see on the left, a light bulb that's shining. And we can think of the bulb as our minds and the light as the light of consciousness. So the bulb is emanating light. You know, light is coming from the bulb, but Light doesn't really come from the bulb, as we see when we turn off the switch. Light doesn't come from the bulb, light is just the conduit. And it's similarly with our minds. Our minds are instruments of perception. They seem to be conscious, they are conscious, but the consciousness is not inherent in the mind. It is a consciousness of Purusha that shines through the mind. And the same thing applies to all of our talents, all of our faculties. Um, they all don't belong to us. And there are lots of lovely stories from the Upanishads um, where, you know, the gods and the faculties think they're all so clever and, you know, they can do all these wonderful things. And then suddenly the power, the light is switched off, as it were, to their, these powers and they find that they're totally and utterly dependent. 
Okay, I'm going to show you just one more slide. Um, and this is a, oops, an expansion. I'm not going to go through this. Um, there's only one or two points I want to make from this slide. So this is, this is expands how it is that from this in, initial coming together of these two fundamental principles, the whole universe evolves, creation evolves from subtle matter to, to gross matter and to the physical universe. So the first thing that I want to point out is that Samkhya philosophy is not the same as Cartesian dualism because Descartes said, yes, there are two fundamental substances, mind and matter. And he got into great trouble because if mind and matter are two different substances, how can my mind tell something totally different, my body, to raise the arm and yet it comes up just like that? So there is no such problem here with Samkhya because mind is understood to be subtle matter. So in Ayurveda um, medical science, there's absolutely no difficulty understanding how the mind, you know, affects the body. But here, the distinction is between mind with between matter, which includes mind, subtle matter, and consciousness. Um, so what this diagram shows is how the world evolves from its state of latency through subtle levels of the mind, and we haven't had chance to go into them. Um, Patanjali just talks about chitta as the mind, but actually um, the mind has various functions um, which are laid out here, but we, we have no time to go into them just now. Um, and uh, Okay, so yes, so the world is is evolving out of its state of latency in conjunction with Purusha. Um, and notice how Purusha is there from the very beginning. So this is another point that in this philosophy, there's no way that consciousness can be seen as um, an epiphenomenon. It's not just a sideshow or a side effect of matter when it becomes sufficiently highly organized. It is absolutely fundamental and that absolutely everything, even stones and, you know, inanimate matter in some sense um, originates from this conjunction of Purusha and Prakriti. So in some sense it has intelligence. The last thing that I want to point out from this diagram is that it has a very interesting way of describing the world. And it's these last three horizontal um, ovals, which are three sets of five, actually are Samkhya's description of the world, the physical universe. And on the right-hand side, we have five states of matter which are ether or space, air, fire, water, and earth. And on the far left-hand side, we have five sense organs, which are the organs that see, that feel, that touch, that hear, that smell. And what's so interesting, and this is, you learn all this if you study Ayurveda, is that there is an exact correlation between each of the five sense organs and each of the five states of matter. Let's leave out the organs of action for the moment. And I think when the British first went to India and they heard about, you know, Ayurvedic medicine or, you know, they heard about this, this account of science, this science of the universe, they probably thought it was very primitive science. But actually, it has an entirely different aim. It's not trying to look into matter on ever more microscopic levels. What it does do though, it shows the purpose of creation because in this philosophy, the creation does have a purpose. And what you see here is that the purpose is to be seen and to be known, to see and to know. 
So in the Yoga Sutras, Patanjali, <clears throat> he says actually there are two purposes to creation. One is for experience and the other is for liberation. And liberation is represented by that, that uh, arrow that goes back up to the source. Anyway, to go into that, we'd have to go into karma and all these sorts of things. And we're not going to do that because I don't, I've spoken for quite a long time. Um, I think I've spoken for long enough. If you want to ask about the things that I haven't talked about, um, you know, if you want to ask about, um, you know, the obstacle, why it is that we're born not knowing who we are, you know, what are the hindrances and how does that all work? Or if you want to know more about the eight limbs of yoga, and actually they are very interesting, particularly the way meditation is described in the last three limbs. Um, I'm very happy to, to try and answer any of those questions. But I think for now, I'm just going to come back to be with you all and stop sharing.